Hello there. Welcome to Online River Center Church, where we are surviving the COVID-19 outbreak. We are going to start with some worship and then a message and some special announcements from Dallas and Sarah McKinley and some special instructions on how to survive this outbreak. Thank you. Thank you, Levi, for that that great introduction. That that's a lot of fun. Praise God. I'm glad we can come together this way today. Uh, we do have a lot happening from Worship Word and then some important announcements at the end of this video. But uh, I just want to let you know, it's been so precious to me uh, to be back from Oxford. Each connection I've had with someone, even electronically, has been really great. And I, I got to connect with Alicia. Um, just yesterday when we taped worship and uh, today she came over just to drop something off. It was just so precious. And then um, just had a conversation with a couple different people online and it's so precious. And, uh, you know, this is what we really want to foster as a church, um, loving each other and staying connected during this time. Sarah has a couple things to talk about there. Amen. Well, when um, Dallas had first asked me if I wanted to share something today, uh, the first thing that popped into my head was the scripture in Hebrews uh, ten twenty five that says, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This it seems like such a peculiar scripture at this time when, you know, the government is saying we really should not be assembling together. But if we think about the circumstances that the writer of Hebrews is instructing this to the early church, the church of the New Testament did not have it easy. They had it way worse than we do. Um, they, were, they were being killed. The persecution was rampant. These people had to hide underground. You know, They had to go to underground churches and meet in small groups. Um, it was not easy for them. The point that I feel that the he, the writer of Hebrews is making is that, that we have to be very intentional. And that's what I feel is the word to us right now. Even though a month ago, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, we could just go to church, go to our small groups, and it was easy. And now it's not easy, but that doesn't mean it's not true. It was true for them when it was difficult, and it's true for us when it's difficult. Um, so my encouragement to you today is to just be intentional to make those connections happen. This is the opportunity for us to really practice, not just what we preach as a church, but what we really do believe. I know River Center Church believes in the idea of community, that we are there for one another. Um, so be sure you're checking up on, on one another and, and seeing, how, seeing how each other is doing. Set up FaceTime conversations, like video chats. Uh, Facebook Messenger is another way. You can video call um, each other that way. Um, you know, we, we just have to be a little creative. But God's going to allow us to do it. He's going to give us an anointing so that we can stay connected. This is not a time for us to be a rock, to be an island, to be isolated to ourselves. That That is not healthy for any of us. And it definitely violates God's word. Now, one way to for us to be connected spiritually, um, on Facebook Messenger, there is a, a prayer request thread and uh, every day, Lord willing, I'm going to be posting a, a focus for prayer. If you are not on that thread, um, message me uh, on Facebook or send me a text or whatever, and, and I can add you to that group. Um, or if you don't have Facebook Messenger, I can just text those prayer focuses um, individually to you. So just, just want to encourage you stay connected and and let's not forsake the assembling of ourselves together even though this day is is odd this is a strange time that we're living in um but we we still need to honor what god is saying yeah and you may have your own ways of staying connected to people uh that you know in the church maybe a lot of people aren't even on facebook but uh you may be on some other platforms or just calling or texting or whatever you can uh, this is an important time to stay together. You never know when somebody's going through difficulties. We're doing okay. We've got some rationing we've had to start. Uh, my caramel supply is almost down to half on Sarah's homemade caramel. 
That's why I included this here. But a country boy will survive. I wondered why that was there. Yeah. I, I didn't know, ask. I'm just letting them know I'm suffering. <laughs> oh, no, but we love you. I'm so excited to worship today. The worship's going to be wonderful, I believe. I would encourage you, if you get a chance, if you can pause the video right now and grab somebody or be with someone else to worship with them and listen to the word with them, mm -hmm. that's all the better. That's how we were meant to meant to uh, seek the Lord is together. Right? Mm -hmm. God bless.
God, we thank you for that confidence that we have because you are our rock. And we can find our safety and our security and our health and our well-being in you. God, we can find love and joy and peace in you in the midst of any storm, God. We thank you for the privilege of building our house upon the rock of Jesus Christ. Not on shifting sand, not on fear, not on worry. We thank you, Jesus. We worship you. You are worthy of praise. You are worthy to be glorified and honored. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We set our eyes on you. We fix our gaze on you. Let's look to God's word this morning. We're going to begin in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you have a Bible, follow along. We'll read a few scriptures. Let's pray. God, I just pray as we go to your word that you'd lead us and guide us. I just thank you for your provision, for your love, for your leadership. I just praise you. We just thank you for all you have done in our lives and for all you have ahead. Thank you for the opportunities you're providing us as your people to stand out, to shine, to be salt in the earth and light in the earth. I thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. All right, give thanks in all circumstances, pray without ceasing. These are crazy times, you know, coronavirus is upon us and, uh, it's hard to know what to do. That's really what we're going to talk about today. Um, two big things from the scripture that God's been laying on my heart. And they both center around um, a Christian understanding of what this life is about and a Christian understanding of what our, our calling is as we live, as we move forward. And uh, even as the world goes into what for most leaders is uncharted territory leading in this kind of a crisis, knowing what to do, um, you know, we can know what to do. We're following Jesus. This isn't the first time there's been a plague, okay? And this isn't the first time Christians have had to navigate crisis in their nations. And uh, that's good news because the Bible's really clear. It gives us a lot of instruction. Today, we're going to focus on two things and then continue moving forward as a church uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, we're not putting our Christianity on hold. The church isn't called to, um, to take a break. We may not be having public services this week or for a few weeks or maybe for a long time, but we're going to continue moving forward as the church. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit as well. But crazy time. So uh, Seth and Anna, my son Seth and his fiance Anna are here, been here all week. So we went and we played some zombies video games down in our family room, and uh, everybody then wanted to watch I Am Legend, which is a zombie movie as well. So it's been an interesting week talking about crazy pandemics, epidemics, plagues, and uh, the meme verse has been amazing. I'll probably show you a few of these here, as you've probably seen a few already on this video, but... Uh, it's good to be able to just sit back and though we take things seriously because we love people and because obviously there are real dangers that we're dealing with, um, we also know that Jesus Christ is on the throne and that God is in charge. And that's good news. That's very good news. Here he says, give thanks in all circumstances. 
How do we give thanks in this circumstance? What should we be thankful for? Not in some nebulous sense, like God could work something good in my life, only that happens all the time for us it should happen all the time for us as Christians, but in a greater sense, what can we really be thankful for uh, coming out of this situation? Let's talk about a couple things. First off, John chapter 16, if you want to turn there, John 16, and I have 27 through 33 written down, but I'm not going to read all of that. I'll just start in verse 31 of John 16. Jesus answered them, do you believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. I thought that was funny when I read it. Each one scattered to their own home. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Except in Jesus' day, well, you know. Here we are scattered to our own homes, but we're not leaving Jesus behind. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. Well, that's something I, each one of us can say to ourselves, even if you are literally all alone in your home right now. The Father is with you. God is with you. God has a plan for you, a mission for you this week. It's not just a hideout. He has a mission. I've said these things to you that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So the fact that we'd have difficulties and trials is, is not, should not be a surprise to anyone. If it is, ever comes to be a surprise to us, it's because we've kind of lost sight of the big picture. This world's gonna be full of troubles, trials, and difficulties, along with joy and peace for us as followers of Jesus uh, that is beyond human description. But our ultimate hope is not in, in, in this short life. It is in eternity to come with Christ. And this is our training ground. This is our time to get prepared for all that's ahead. This is our time, uh, time to shine. The time for our character to be proven true. That we would come through the fire as gold, as precious stones, and not as hay or wood or stubble. Things that will be burnt up and will matter in no way in eternity. They'll be forgotten. They'll be puffs of smoke here and then gone. We want to be the precious materials that remain. Amen. So we have these scriptures and, uh, you know, what are we to do now that we know Christ has promised to be with us and we know we're to give thanks. Two things, I'm just going to share these pretty quickly today. First off, we can be thankful in the situation as believers because this is good preparation. It is good preparation for us for what is to come. Now, what do I mean? If you have a Bible, you can turn it also to Matthew chapter 24. Let me flip over there as well. Matthew 24, uh, verse 21 to 31. This is what Jesus has to say about the tribulation or the great the great tribulation that's coming. There've been many tribulations. If you were in a concentration camp or a prison somewhere for your faith or for no reason other than tyranny, that persecution is as great for you as it's gonna get. Maybe your life would be taken from you for Jesus or simply for being a decent person. But there's a tribulation that is going to be like that, but scattered through the whole world, the Bible teaches. It's going to be a serious time, much more serious than what we're experiencing right now. And now there's this scripture I love. It says, it says, if you fail when it comes time, you know, uh, to run into battle, you know, how are you going to, how are you going to fare when it's time uh, to run, you know, with horses? Uh, I just butchered it. Sorry. I should have looked it up. I'm not, I'm not going to recut this video though. It's all right. Anyhow, the point is, you know, uh, if, if we are scared of little things and they stop us, from accomplishing what we're set out to do in Christ, what are we gonna do when huge things come? And so one of the reasons, the number one reason to be thankful at this time is that this is a good preparation for all of us, a good wake up call for us to be ready to walk through whatever comes in Jesus name, with the love of Christ and the care of Christ and fulfill our purpose in Christ. So Matthew 24 here says, there will be great tribulation. 
such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, this is verse 22, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. And imagine a time where, where everything, the way, it's, the way it's falling out, the way plagues and wars and famines and everything else is happening is so great that if it didn't stop, all human life would cease on this planet. Elon Musk wants us to, wants us to be an interplanetary species uh, just in case something like this happens. Maybe that'll happen. Sounds great. But our ultimate hope can only be in one place. And that's that God himself knows what's happening, has seen what is coming, and has made a provision in Jesus Christ for life, for the kingdom of God to move forward, and for his eternal purposes to be accomplished. Praise God. Praise God. That gives me great hope. It says, if God hadn't cut those days short, no human life would have been saved. But he does cut those days short because he's in control. Revelation chapter 9, verse 15. And we could, we could have many scriptures. This is the only one we'll do, though, here that talk about this. It says, the four angels who had been prepared for the hour. Again, they had been prepared for that hour. We have a God who knows what's happening and is in control. For the day, for the month, and the year, God knows the exact time that this great tribulation is going to be happening. He knows. They were released to kill a third of mankind. This is one of the great judgments on the earth, or one of the pictures of that judgment here in Revelation. Wow. A third of the earth. We're not talking about fifteen or 20,000 people or even 100,000 people. Who knows how many will ultimately die from what we're experiencing right now. But it seems unlikely it'll reach a million people. I mean, that would be a long ways. Maybe it will, who knows? But think about now hundreds of millions, billions of people dying. The Bible says there'll be so much chaos and pain and torment that people will go into caves and they'll cry out, fall on me to the mountains because they'll want it all to end. Praise God, we have a hope in the middle of all this. Some people think we'll be gone from this particular great tribulation, you know, raptured away ahead of time. Others think the church will be going through this victoriously. But either way, this life is short. There are going to be difficulties. And then there's going to be eternity with Christ for those who have faith in him. And that, that's what I praise him for. All right, back to Matthew chapter 24. It says, if those days had not been cut short, no human would have been saved. Move on to verse 23. And here are some common things we experience in tough times. You've probably seen them to some degree, at least in the media. The first one is false hopes. Verse 23 says, then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs, false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect, false saviors. I'm so thankful for the work our government is doing, at least from my perspective as just a normal person, seeing what I can see. I'm thankful they're not ignoring this. I'm thankful that they're taking what seem to be the best steps they know how to, to combat it. You know, we have our social distancing and other things that are happening, they're, they're probably going to make a big difference. Probably many lives will be saved. I praise God for that. But you know what? I, I can't put all my hope in that because they're just human beings. We have a God, though, that we can trust. That's where I put my hope. So uh, all other false hopes I've seen are, you know, cures for the cures for the coronavirus. It's usually, uh, usually bunk. Um, so far, you know, home remedies and things like that. One thing we know for sure, if we're following Jesus, his purpose will be accomplished in our lives. We can praise him for that. Another thing we see, verse 25, is panic. See, I told you beforehand, if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. Uh, panic is for suckers. We all know that. If you've ever tried to invest 
and, uh, you know, and gone through a big dip, which I've gone through several now, um, in my lifetime, several crashes of the market. The, there's only one thing you can do that's really, 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 really bad. And that's to panic, to be afraid, to be afraid, to be afraid, and then finally panic and sell everything you have at the bottom. And then the market comes back up. That's the worst thing you can do. And so uh, panic is like that in our lives because it takes us when we're, when we're at our most vulnerable, when we need to be at our most clear headed and it causes us to do irrational, ridiculous things. If you have a neighbor who, knew, who needs hand soap or masks or toilet paper, you need to go share with that neighbor. That's what we do as Christians. Um, if, there's, if they need help at the hospital taking care of people, God forbid if coronavirus would be here and there'd be a need greater than our regular medical staff can handle and you have some ability to help, as a Christian, you need to be down there helping, even if it puts yourself at risk. This is what we do. We put others above ourselves. We love others. We care for them. We don't panic. We don't want to die alone in a room stacked with toilet paper and masks on. <laughs> okay. We want to die doing the work of Jesus Christ. That's our calling. In fact, that's why this is such a great preparation for us, because this is the time where the church is meant to shine the very brightest, where we have a, we have we have concern for others. That's one of the reasons we didn't have service together in a large group this week. But our concern is, is more than just saving ourselves. It's actually helping them. Maybe it's delivering food to someone who can't really get out. And, you know, whatever it is, we're helping them. We're not panicking. If we can't handle the corona, okay, how are we going to handle real shaking, real tribulation, even if it's not the great tribulation, how are we going to handle that if we can't handle this? No, this is our practice. This is our preparation. It's kind of like this. So um, I went to basic training as a very young man. It was the summer between my junior and senior year of high school. And at the time I went in at least, you could go and uh, join the National Guard and, and go to basic training at that time. And so that's what I did. And, uh, you know, being a, a young man, I was excited to do it. There were a lot of fun things, but it was very scary. At least at that time in the army, it was a very intimidating process. Not a lot of sleep, a lot of people yelling at you continually. It was, it was a soul shaking experience. And I'm thankful for it because not because it was fun at the time. In fact, I hated it so much that I requested that I be able to stay on and complete my like advanced training on this during the same summer. I actually missed part of the school year to finish that because I did not want to go back. <laughs> That's how much I hated it. I'm like, no matter what it takes, I want to finish now because I do not want to have to come back to this place. Okay. Now fast forward to the end of college. I'd, I'd been in ROTC I, and I was going into the army now as an officer. And so I had to go to officer basic. And officer basically, it was a different situation. You know, you weren't, you weren't dealing with raw, uh, you know, 17 year olds. You're dealing with people who are serious and have a little more thought that they've given to their careers and things like that. But the stakes were much higher. The stakes were your career, how well you did at this officer training and the, the stakes were, did you get to pick the branch you'd be in or would you get, would you get put somewhere you may not like to be? And you could be there for 20, 30 years. I didn't know that I was going to uh, be going into ministry at that time. And so the stakes were very high, but you know what? I was very calm. I was at peace. I wasn't even worried about it. Why? Because I had already been through that basic training. I had already had all those people screaming at me. And so when I went there as an officer a few years later and people were yelling and screaming and stuff like that, I, I was excited to play the game. <laughs> okay. Because it's because my mindset was in a completely different place. Instead of being the victim, I was the victor and I did very well. Now, this is how we, this is one of the reasons we can be thankful because this is how God prepares us for truly important things. It's like if you've never been through a hard circumstance, if you've never walked through something difficult and come out the other side alive and thriving, then why should God trust you with important things? See? So here, 
during this time with coronavirus and being in our homes and all the strange things happening, this is our time to walk through, to work through our fears, to work through our inhibitions, to work through both having the right attitude toward our authorities and being thankful for them and having the right attitude toward our calling in the church that we don't miss it. Amen. This is our time. And I'm so thankful for that. And the, the ultimate uh, truth of this passage we, we see on is that uh, in the middle of this, Christ won't be hidden. Verse 27, when the Son of Man comes, it'd be like lightning shining from the east and the west. No one's going to miss Jesus coming into this tribulation. But boy, that's, we want that to be true of ours. I want that to be true of my neighbors, my family. They don't miss Jesus in the middle of this. He can't be missed. He's like lightning in the sky. Praise God. And then verse 29, we see the ultimate end of the story. And uh, verse 31, he'll send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather the elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. We see God doing something good in all of this. And that's the way it is with the tribulation too, or with, with even his judgments at the end of time. He's doing something good. He, what he's doing is he's removing that which can't be in heaven so that we can be with him in heaven. There's gonna be no murder in heaven. There'll be no lying. There'll be no stealing. There'll be no selfish marriage partners. It's going to be a completely different situation. That selfishness will be set aside. We're going to be following him. We'll be like the angels, he says. And so he, that's what he's doing here at the end is he's preparing a people that will be wholly his. He's preparing the earth. He's saving all of creation from the effects of sin. Praise God. And he has the wisdom to know how to do it. This is not that. This is not the great tribulation. This is something we need to walk through uh, with strength, knowing that God has a plan for our families, our neighborhoods, our town, our state. All right. Second thing. First, we're thankful because this is good preparation for what's to come and an opportunity for us to shine. The second reason I'm thankful is that the church knows all about how to handle the plague. Yeah, let me say that again. The church knows all about how to handle the plague. The first plagues we see recorded uh, with the interaction with the church come in the second century. This is where we have we begin to have some real good history of what was going on. And, and what we see is that as the plague came in, as plagues came in, the church exploded in growth. The reason was because the church was caring for the poor. In the middle of a society where everybody was running, trying to survive, shunning people, closing them out. The church was there helping, caring, some of them even getting sick and dying, but being an example for Christ. And through that first plague that we really have a good record of, the first major one in the second century, we see the church thriving, growing. I want to recommend to you an article by Lyman Stone. If you're interested in this, you can look it up online, L-Y-M-A-N-S-T-O-N-E, Lyman Stone. And they just outline some of this. It's really great. Good reading if you're interested. But uh, second big plague that he talks about is the plague of the Cyprian plague, which people think may have been some form of Ebola. And if you know bad diseases, okay, there you got one right there. And we don't know for sure because we don't have samples of it, of course, but they think this could have been what was happening. And the plague is actually named after the bishop of the area where they were experiencing the plague. Think about that. The impact of the church was so great that the plague got named after the bishop of the church where they experienced it. The Cyprian plague, it's called. And uh, it was in the third century in Roman era, and it was uh, actually created a great crisis all throughout Rome. And again, it triggered an explosive growth in Christianity throughout the empire. We have this recorded both uh, from Christian perspectives and Roman historians talk about this. Emperor Julian actually complained about it because they, they, they couldn't stop the spread of Christianity because the Christians kept caring for their own and they kept caring for the people who weren't in the church who were sick. They were fearless. People would be dying horrifically. Everyone would abandon them and the church would come in and take care of them and love them without any concern for themselves. But you know what that really meant. That meant for those people in the church, I mean, some of them died because of this. Some of their children died because of this. They were willing to do this for Jesus Christ. Okay, that, that's gotta be our attitude. That is the attitude of Christ, ready to lay down our lives. 
Now, part of the reason we don't have uh, a big gathering this week and next week for sure um, is because of the same kind of love. We don't want to, even if I feel healthy, if I've been exposed to this, I don't want to spread it to someone else and make them sick. And so that is right now how we're showing love for this. But that's not going to remain the same long term. This is changing all the time. We People around us need help and we need to be ready to help them and do it in a way that's wise, do it in a way that really is a blessing to them, of course. And uh, that's what we're looking to do in this situation, just the same. And uh, interestingly, sociologists, as they've looked at this, the way the Romans, Roman Empire went through this plague in the third century, it, interestingly, the towns that had large Christian populations seem to have only had a death rate of about half that of the towns where there wasn't a Christian presence. And Christian sociologists, at least, attribute this to the church caring for those that were sick. Praise God. Think about that. The death rate is cut in half because there are Christians everywhere that are caring. Amen. That's our calling. Uh, one more thing, one more, one more sighting of this was uh, famously Martin Luther. And he was in um, Wittenberg when the plague hit, the bubonic plague. And... Uh, he was told by many he should flee the city and he refused. He said, he later wrote a pamphlet, a little, a little book you can read on this. Um, and he said, Christian doctors shouldn't be fleeing hospitals. They wouldn't do that. That would be shirking their responsibilities. They're called to minister there. Christian, um, and of course in his day, hospitals was a different, it wasn't hospitals, but they shouldn't be fleeing from their patients. Christian governors and leaders shouldn't be fleeing from their posts because they have a calling, people need them there. And Christian pastors should not be fleeing from their posts either. And so he refused to leave. The result was one of his daughters died of the plague. Directly, it looks like directly because he chose to stay and minister to people. And as he came through that, he did not have any resentment at all, but it was one of the times I feel like where he just demonstrated most beautifully, his trust in the Lord, that the Lord had a plan and our calling in times of crisis as Christians is to crawl up onto the cross with Christ and be willing to sacrifice ourselves for the world around us because of the love of Jesus Christ. Praise God, that's so powerful. So that's the way the church is handled plagues in the past. And that's the way we're going to handle it too. Now in our day, it's a bit different. We have medical professionals and nurses, you know, that are, that are doing things. If, if we were there, uh, you know, caring for patients in certain different ways, we'd just be in the way. So how will we do this practically? We're going to have to find that out as time goes forward, but we will most certainly be praying for people. We will most certainly be caring for our neighbors, making sure they're okay and others around us and doing everything we can to be a blessing and we are going to be the church, amen. This is not a time for us to take a break as the church. The church isn't just a meeting on Sunday mornings, far from it. So this is our time to move forward and be serious. All right, let me talk about that, just a couple different things on that, and I have some notes. I wanna make sure I don't forget anything. Yeah, so this isn't our time to give in to fear, obviously. Um, Next week, we will have a video, the same, similar, something similar to what we had this week. Uh, but from that point on, we're going to be, you know, taking a fresh look. This coming week, we'll be taking a fresh look at exactly how we're going to be moving forward. We don't know what's going to happen. We'll have to deal with it as it comes. One possibility would be if we, if, if we're asked not to meet in large groups, then we'll just move to smaller groups on Sundays. We might have, for instance, uh, several groups around town, around the area. Or you can go and be part of the group. Uh, there might be a video message, and then you'd have worship and a meal together as uh, as a group on a Sunday. That would be one possibility, and uh, you know, and those, so those would be small group sized gatherings. But then also our groups that are already um, going. This is this is such an important time for you. I know several of you are going to continue um, this week. Uh, a couple of you have, uh, are like taking a break at least for this week to see what's happening, I would encourage you, this is the time to get your strategy. Uh, talk to some of your group leaders on the phone, uh, decide what you're gonna do next week if you're not meeting this week, and and begin, uh, begin to take that ministry seriously. People need your ministry in your small group, they need it. They need to be eating that meal together with you. They need to have someone there that they can share with face to face 
and uh, you guys need to be praying together, lifting up the name of Jesus together, and th there's no reason we can't meet in small groups. The church, um, you know, this is a special circumstance. We wouldn't normally be canceling our larger groups for any reason, but we do it now because of love. We do it to honor our leaders, but we do it also just because of love. We don't want to be spreading something to someone else and harming them. Of course not. But in the middle of that, you know, we are not going to abandon. We cannot abandon the call of the Lord. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. That's his call. It's his command because he knows what we need. The world would be better off. Let me put it this way. Our town cannot survive without the grace of God moving in it. And so we have to be part of that. We have to be part of that. So we will find a way. So let's find a way to do that with grace. We'll find a way to do that that uh, is honoring to what our government's asking us to do. And I'm very thankful for them, but also is not shirking of, of this opportunity or our responsibilities. Amen. Amen. So this is a great opportunity. This week, call each other up. Text each other. We're doing that quite a bit here. And uh, I want to make sure all my neighbors right around where I live are good. Don't just stay in your family your family zone. I mean, it's great to be there with them. Obviously, this is a time not to be out and about more than we have to. But there could be people right around us who are suffering, who need actual physical help, or who need someone just to pray for them. You can do that over the phone, or you can do that through a doorway. You know, knock on a, it's okay if you feel led by the spirit, knock on a door of a neighbor or someone and say, hey, are you okay? I know we're, you know, we're, we're not hanging out in large groups now, but I just want to make sure you're all right. Is there anything I can pray for you about? And then just pray a blessing over their household. If God leads you to do that, you do it, man. We're the church, amen? But he may, there may be someone, he leads you to do that through a text message or through a, um, through a phone call or something like that. That might be most appropriate at times too. So just be led by the spirit, praise God. And um, yeah, that's probably it for now. We're not checking out spiritually. Amen. All right, I'm going to pray a blessing over you. Lord God, I just pray a blessing over each person hearing this message, that you would strengthen them. I thank you, Lord, that we can be, we can be very thankful in this circumstance, that what you're doing is you're purifying your bride. That's part of what you're doing in us. God, you're making us ready. You're expanding our thinking. In, in the world, in true chaos, how, does, how do we move forward as a church? If we can't meet together in large groups, how do we move forward as a church? If people are dying around us, how do we move forward as a church? How do we show the love of Jesus Christ? Lord, I thank you that you're teaching us this. And God, right now, I pray that we would come through, we would come forth as gold. I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, that you'd speak to us. Holy Spirit, we invite you to speak to us. Show us how to love well. Show us how to minister well to the people around us. I pray, Lord, that you'd uh, strengthen our prayer lives during this time. God, let us use what you've given us well if, if we have extra time at home and such. But Lord God, even if even as we see people and the things we have to do out and about, I just pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us. Holy Spirit, let us, let us show the world what it means to have faith in you, to be full of love and truth and grace, and to know that you are in charge, Lord Jesus Christ, and that you are fulfilling something good through our lives when we say yes to you, when we step out for you. I just praise you and thank you for this, Jesus. In your precious name, amen. Amen, I love you. If you need something, don't, don't hesitate to call Sarah or I, any of the leaders, friends at church, others like that. And you know the limits of our, you know, we're not, we're not the hospital, we're not a lot of places, but we can pray, we can love, and sometimes we can help in practical ways too. To make, there shouldn't be anybody um, unable to eat because they can't get what they need. And, and then there's stuff going on all around town, I know, to help help with that kind of thing. And I praise God for that. I just praise God so much. I thank God we live in a time where um, there's a lot of caring that's going on. Praise God. But you know, all the caring in the world, if people still die in darkness and don't know their eternal savior, is not enough. We've got, we've got that salt. We've got that light in our caring and in our love. Let's bring the most important thing of all, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless. All right. We have a special opportunity to serve that came in from St. Mary's. I want to tell you about before that, I wanted to talk about offerings. 
Of course, the needs of the church continue. In fact, this is an especially important time to keep giving. You know, our missionaries still need supported. Uh, you know, our bills basically also continue during this time. And a lot of people may not think to give if they don't attend. But I want to say especially thank you to all of you who have made tithing a regular part of your lives that are going to give no matter what to the Lord. I appreciate that. So there are a couple ways you can give if you're not coming to Sunday morning services. First is just send it to our P.O. Box. Uh, several of you already do. Some people do bill pay that already goes there. That's just P.O. Box 1012-1012, P.O. Box 1012, Pierce, South Dakota, 57501. And uh, you can just send, send checks there. We check that every week, at least, or twice a week. The other way is uh, I just opened up a PayPal for the church, and this will be on our website in coming, coming weeks, uh, like a link. But uh, you can give through PayPal to rivercenterchurch at gmail.com. That's our PayPal address is rivercenterchurch at gmail.com. And so uh, PayPal, I, I don't know exactly how it works. It, it looks like they're going to charge us 3%, but I, I think it's something like that. But that's okay. Um, if that's what you need to do, that's just fine. Appreciate that very much. And that is something new for us. So if there are glitches, you know, I, I will let you know. All right, Sarah has something. Well, we have a, an exciting opportunity with our sister church, James River Church, um, May 1 and 2, uh, Faith Infusion Women's Conference. Um, you can register at Eventbrite, www.eventbrite.com. Um, if you want to freeze the screen and get all the information yeah, that you want to get. But that's going to be an exciting time. And, you know, like I said last week, there is one thing that is certain, and that is that nothing is certain. So, but we are charging ahead, assuming that this is going to happen. Praise God, but wanted to give you that information. All right. And then that last opportunity I was telling you about from Karen Gallagher sent this to me. Uh, she works at St. Mary's. Good afternoon. I pray that you all are staying strong in our trust in God and assured that we are not alone, do not fear. I'm providing an update on Avera St. Mary's response to COVID-19 pandemic. We're preparing for a likely surge of patients. She goes on and talks about that a little bit. Um, here are just a few examples of what we're doing. We're using telemedicine, telemed exposure. So if you're nervous to go to the doctor, don't forget about that, that there's a lot of telemedicine happening right now. There are ways you can do that to get some information and help without going to the doctor first. We're limiting visitors to our hospital and clinic uh, and not allowing visitors to Varus Mary House long-term, okay? We're encouraging long-term care centers to screen residents for symptoms daily. That's great. We're screening employees. Uh, they're temporarily suspending Avera public events, like everything else pretty much, and they're postponing elective surgery cases and non-essential procedures and appointments. That's happening with dentists and uh, eye doctors too, pretty much. So we, we anticipate our healthcare, here's our opportunity to help. To, providers may have childcare needs. Critical hospital staff may not have childcare options with schools closed and potential daycare closures pending. This is where we're hoping you may be able to help. We would like to assemble a list of people in our community who'd be willing to, con to be contacted by a hospital employee in need of childcare. We are encouraging small group child care options in order to lessen community spread and adhere to CDC mitigation recommendations. In other words, they're trying to not just have 30 kids in one place. Interested parties must have completed a background check and be in good standing. Our employees have all completed and passed background checks as well. The hospital would supply the collected names and phone numbers to employees needing assistance the two parties would be responsible to arrange details. So basically, if you, if you um, come on this list, there just may be someone at the hospital that needs help, they would contact you personally and you would see if you can work it out or not. Contact michelle.barrett at avera.org. I'll just spell that and it should be up on your screen as well. M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E dot B-A-R-R-E-T-T at avera.org. And she can also answer any of the questions. And that was from uh, Karen Gallagher. So if you, if you didn't get that or something, just contact me. I'll make sure you get that information 
but that's a great opportunity for us to be able to actually support them. Yes. And I know several of you would already have that background check and uh, know how to do a good job with taking right. care of kids. And so what a great opportunity to show yeah. them that we care about them and that we're, we're available if, if the worst happens. Okay, so. yeah. All right, anything else, my dear? I think that'll do it. All right, love you guys. We're going to do something similar next week. And uh, during this time, we'll be asking the Lord, you know, if this continues, uh, what we should do. As I talked about in my message, we are going to be moving forward, even if we have to move to smaller groups on Sunday mornings as well as our midweeks uh, to worship God on his day. Uh, we will do that, but we'll get the details worked out. I'm sure he'll lead us in the, in the weeks to come. He's right. faithful. Amen. Love you. God bless. Love you.